Welcome back to Theories of Knowledge, the first collaborative online course for Arts and Humanities doctoral students across Scotland, brought to you by the Scottish Graduate School for Arts and Humanities with support from the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the Scottish Funding Council. Theories of Knowledge examines the ways in which philosophers and critical theorists have influenced and continue to animate how we understand knowledge production within the arts and humanities. This evening, Professor Richard Coyne will speak to us on knowledge and ignorance in our digital age. Richard Coyne researches and teaches in information technology in practice, computer-aided design and architecture, the philosophy of information technology, digital media, and design theory at the University of Edinburgh. Professor Coyne is academic director of the MSc in Design and Digital Media and program director of the MSc by Research in Digital Media and Culture. He is author of several books on the implications of information technology and design with MIT Press and Rutledge, and his research has been supported by the AHRC, EPSRC, and SCRAN. Professor Coyne is currently investigating the way we configure spaces through the use of pervasive mobile devices such as smartphones, iPods, and GPS. He recently completed a book for the Rutledge Thinkers for Architects series entitled Derrida for Architects, and is co-investigator on a major funded project about mobility and aging entitled Mobility, Mood, and Place. As always, if you're with us remotely, log in to notheory.org and navigate to the Digital Minds post on the discussion page to share your thoughts. Professor Kuhn. Okay, thank you, Katie, and thanks for uh, wrestling with the technology and getting consulted. Um, I won't remark on the irony that uh, here we are looking at digital media. Inevitably, invariably, you're going to have trouble. Okay, this is the series. Now, uh, anything that's large uh, is meant to be read. Anything that's small, you don't have to read. Uh, and in any case, you probably can't because of the screen resolution here. But here we are, right at the end of this series. And it looks fascinating, and I haven't been able to watch uh, all of these. Uh, but obviously, it's a, it's a broad scope um, study for this, um, this series. So we're concluding with Digital Minds, a title that was given to me by Katie. I like the title that uh, you just uh, revamped uh, as you revamped it there. Um, okay, Digital Minds. Uh, I'm Richard Coyne. I guess it's worth just indicating that uh, my interests are uh, thoughts with digital technologies. My PhD many years ago uh, was to do with artificial intelligence and design, and so I was full on in the um, technical realm. I was working with engineers. Uh, I, I believed actually back in the 80s, in the idea that everything could be somehow reduced to logic or everything important in the world. I was a kind of a positivist. Oh, this is going to be recorded, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm a reformed positivist. <laughs> and uh, I, my opinions were subverted in the late 80s and into the 90s uh, with ideas to do with hermeneutics and phenomenology. Uh, but I've never abandoned computing. That's still the center of my interest. And I've sought to bring some of these ideas to bear on the... Uh, on our understanding of, of digital technologies. And uh, the reference to Derrida, of course, uh, indicates perhaps uh, an interest in sort of perverse re reversals of, of priorities, which you'll get to as I progress, and you'll see that. Um, I guess the, the, the major uh, rhetoric about information technology pertains to this sort of thing. This is uh, by Eric Schmidt, who um, uh, was, was the I can't read it now, but he's uh, a major director, um, executive chairman of Google. And uh, this book, which I labored through, oh yeah, this is being recorded, so I'm very careful with this thing. Uh, okay, he says, by 2025, which isn't that far away, it's getting perilously close, the majority of the world's population will in one generation have gone from having virtually no access to unprivileged information to accessing all the world's information through a device that fits in the palm of the hand. Well, in a way, you sort of think, well, isn't that already the case? Um, we have our smartphones, and the information is there. Of course, uh, there's a great divide, and not everybody has that kind of access in any case. But also, we find, uh, don't we, that the more we use these things, the more we're aware of what we actually cannot ac access through our devices. Uh, there's just loads and loads of stuff in excess of what we can access through, through uh, uh, networks. Anyway, that's one sort of part of the rhetoric that you encounter these days is lots of information. I'm not going to define the difference between information, data, and knowledge. Perhaps that's already been covered before, and in any case, it may sort of emerge as we progress here. Uh, but loads of information. We suggest that we're all going to become knowledgeable, um, but in sort of Derrida fashion, I want to 
focus, at least towards the end of this, on the idea of ignorance. And there are benefits in thinking of ourselves as somewhat ignorant, and they're kind of obvious, but perhaps you can nuance the obviousness of it in some way. But ignorance drives curiosity when we don't know something and we recognize that and we're perhaps inclined to be somewhat curious, and that's good, isn't it, for learning and for research. And also imagination. Uh, we fill in our ignorance with imagination, which is really what, part of what it is to think and to reason and to understand and apply knowledge. So, um, like a good PhD thesis, it's the kind of a thesis that I put in the where it's for this lecture, I'm leaning towards that, contrary to what Schmidt and others say about the importance of knowing everything and having everything at our fingertips. Okay, well, I'm going to rattle through. That was number one, and here's number two, and we're going to go through. I won't tell you how many, and you'll start to count them and get worried. But uh, there's a fair number of these points. Um, and the second one is a counter view, in a way, to what Schmidt is, is articulating. These are both hot books, I have to say, that are mass consumption. Uh, but uh, what does he say? I believe this is uh, Tapscott, Don Tapscott. It's contrary to the idea that we're getting more uh, knowledge. No, sorry, it's, 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 sorry, this is supporting it. The next one is contrary. Okay, we're getting smarter. I believe that we'll see that being immersed in an interactive digital environment has made them smarter. This is the new generation, the net generation, who brought up with, with computers and networks and social media. Um, they may read fewer works of literature, but they devote a lot of time to reading and writing online, as we'll learn. Uh, that activity can be intellectually challenging. Instead of just numbly receiving information, they're gathering it from around the globe with lightning speed. So we're developing new cognitive skills, or at least the generations that are following us, um, and I guess our students, typically, you know, PhDs, undergraduates, whatever, are increasingly in this category. When they write in their blog or contribute a video, they have an opportunity to synthesize and come up with a new formulation, which leads to a giant opportunity for them. This is 2009, just a few years ago, and already it's presuming that loads of people are blogging. Uh, now, blogging, I have to say, I don't have any stats on this, but it kind of hasn't taken off in the way that's implied here. It's not as though all our students are now pumping out stuff online, other than when they're told to, they our students uh, to do with uh, coursework and so on, uh, and we're examining it. But anyway, it's, it's, if not blogging, then maybe some other uh, medium, social media, of course, developed. And we've since 2009. So it's not necessarily a concerted blogging effort as, as quips and comments and imagery and so on. But anyway, he's, he's perhaps part right. Um, they have an opportunity to synthesize and come up with a new formulation which leads to a giant opportunity for them. The next generation has been given the opportunity to fulfill their inherent human intellectual potential as no other generation. So this is a similar kind of rhetoric. It's, it's picking up the benefits of these. Uh, media. Okay, so that's that we're getting smarter. And because we're in an age where neuroscience really has ascendancy, um, he doesn't do it, I don't think, in this passage, but people say, well, actually, we're getting our brains rewired. So instead of saying we learn, and now it's about our brains being reshaped. Okay, here's the contrary view. Uh, and people who write in journalistic mode, I feel like there's a pendulum swing. Maybe they wake up in the morning thinking, I'm going to write a book, I'm going to be all for it or all against it. There's never any kind of academic in between phase, uh, which we as scholars would uh, create. Anyway, losing concentration. This is uh, Nicholas Carr writing which is to show us what the internet is doing to our brains, and it's negative. The internet is changing the way our brains work. Now, this is me summarizing it. Uh, what the net seems to be doing is chipping away my capacity for concentration and contemplation. So that's uh, apparently what's happening according to Carr. I'm summarizing it now. For all the benefits, he thinks the web habituates us to browsing, clicking, skimming, jumping around information. So it's harder now to read books and other substantial texts in a deep and concerted way. At best, we're now dumbed down pseudo-intellectuals who flip along the surface rather than going deep. And this tendency affects anyone habituated to internet use not just the young who have been brought up with it. So it's affecting us middle aged and oldies as well. And I guess academics who are totally steeped in this uh, medium of the internet uh, are prey to or prone to this uh, condition, which is treating things in a fairly shallow way. So the question, I guess, is that we could have a debate and a discussion now. Um, and often I do this in other courses, you know, which side are you on? What do you think? 
is, is the case and what's your experience? And I guess most people would typically say, well, sometimes I feel um, uh, I'm just browsing and my colleagues are being super, super, superficial, etc. Other times I feel, well, we're getting deeper and these media are actually giving us new skills. I guess um, as someone with a sort of humanities orientation, I'm down to, or I'm, I veer towards the view that things get reconfigured. So maybe we are losing skills of concentrating on major tomes or huge novels, some of us, uh, but we're developing other skills as a, a rearrangement of our skill base and, practice, and our practices. Okay, the fourth, fourth point uh, deviates from the derivation from that. It's, 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 it's close. The curiosity deficit I've got here. Now, um, like most social media users, I, I like to take photographs, and I've been driven to do that thanks to Facebook, um, because I can then show off pictures that I've taken, and I'm reasonably proud of my, my photographic prowess, and also I'm delighted to be able to use something as simple as an iPhone to do close-ups and all sorts of things. So there are several photographs I'm showing throughout this which are my own, and there's one example of it. So I went to the Botanics a couple of weeks ago, walking around with a friend, and uh, and I took this picture. Um, and there's something to be said about that uh, in a moment, about what that's showing us. But there's also an app that we, we discovered which um, allows us to identify plants, particularly flowers. Now, flowers, of course, are out of the style of year and they're very interesting because of their form and shape. And re they're relatively easy for software to identify. So there is this app called, it doesn't matter what it's called, it's about identifying plants. And, uh, so you pick up your iPhone, which you can't use because I'm recording this on that. Um, but uh, you uh, take a photograph of the plant, and there it is, a photograph of something you think is amazing. And then, uh, as long as you're online, it sends that image back to a server and uh, somewhere, I don't know where, and then it comes back with a list of options, and it's matched it to that, which you can't read because of the, the light, but it, it, it's not right, it, it's wrong, because it's just plain ordinary dating. And I was in the botanics, and you see names of things, so it's a good way of verifying this system. Anyway, the truth of this is you find that it's a daisy, and there's an upside down picture of a couple of daisies which somebody else had taken, uh, so they have a database of other images that other users of the system have taken. And then also you can see maps of the whole world, and all these photographs that people have taken of flowers, or butterflies, or trees in full form without too much background. Um, so it's, it's a brilliant resource, I mean, a great tool for identifying plants. Now that's kind of weird and interesting because one of the pastimes uh, that I and my friends have sometimes, I guess in that age and of that interest, is identifying plants and uh, identifying buildings, identifying anything. Uh, you know, what, what's the theory of that building over there? Is it, uh, is it Georgian or is it uh, late uh, Victorian? And, and it's kind of a, co a point of conversation. And I think some of us uh, enjoy that sort of speculation about what a thing is and what category it belongs into. And what we don't actually enjoy is some expert coming in on the scene and actually telling us, look, frankly, that's obviously Edwardian, a certain period of star, or telling us this is obviously a daisy, whatever that is. Um, and that closes off the conversation. So this app is a bit like the expert who comes in and closes off the conversation. So we're kind of possibly losing out on an aspect of sociability with these media. Now I was talking to a friend in sociology. Uh, we're sitting out in George Square on one of the sunny afternoons just last week. This is in, in Edinburgh. And uh, she's a sociologist. And it happened that she was studying um, the responses of children to environmental issues, so sustainability and environmentalism and so on. And she was actually quizzing the kids uh, through surveys and so on on their ability to identify flowers, just common, ordinary things like daisies, dandelions, daffodils, uh, whatever, uh, bluebells and so on. And her hypothesis was that if kids can identify things, they're bound to respect them all the more. And if they recognize differences within categories, then that respect will develop and that might feed into their views about environment. So I think that's really interesting. Um, I don't know the outcome of the study as yet. Uh, but then you throw in a technology like this, where you no longer have to memorize what the plant is, nor do you even necessarily have to care about it. So another phenomenon that's occurring uh, in the literature is 
a younger generation, the, the younger generation, whoever they are, um, are bemused by the way grown-ups uh, conduct their conversations, where they're constantly trying to guess things or work things out. So who is the singer of that particular song? Uh, who, who, who was the actor in that movie, or what was the last hit of Frank Sinatra, or whatever? Um, and it's not just to do with <laughs> the kind of sources that we draw on, but the very fact of trying to categorize and work things out. Because the net generation, not only don't they know, but they don't kind of care because they know they could look it up. So this could be a shift in our kind of knowledge practices, that uh, we're less bothered or the next, previous gen, the next generation is less bothered to actually identify certain things, and possibly they're going to be missing out on all sorts of con conversational nuances where people talk, debate, uh, discuss, and pull their ignorance. Now, this is kind of important in the... Uh, uh, another one of my passions at the moment is nature, actually, from an academic point of view, and I'm looking at the conflict between rhetoric and, and narratives to do with the digital versus the natural, whatever that is, and, and how they come together and pitch in opposition to one another. And also we're doing a funded research project that's looking at the natural environment. And one of the hypotheses of the, the natural world in relation to people in it, and, and the study we're doing, is that uh, it's good to be outdoors, it's good to be in the countryside, it's good to be in a natural environment. Uh, part of that is to relieve stress. So we're working at our computers all day indoors, and we're stressed out, and we're concentrating, we're focusing. Uh, we're always going to be concentrating on something. We're always going to be attending to something as human beings. It's built into um, nature. Uh, but what we're concentrating on at the computer, or spreadsheets, or reports, or whatever, uh, is inducing stress, because we have an investment in it, and we have to focus, concentrate, and we have to make decisions around whatever it is we're looking at. Go outdoors, unless you're a horticulturalist, or uh, a gardener, or uh, worrying about the environment in some sort of context. Um, nature is full of stuff to focus on, uh, but it's less demanding. And so the, the experts in the I'm not giving the reference to that, you might say it's slightly worth an addition. Uh, the terminology is of fascination, so that's what the outdoor environment provides. Again, when you throw digital media at that, and smartphones, um, is me taking a photograph of that leaf, enhancing uh, the fascination potential of that leaf. Of course, I may have just taken the photograph. I didn't think to identify the plant. I don't think it's uh, uh, an ash tree, is it? Anyway, the shape of the leaves. Um, but maybe I was satisfied just to take the picture and then go away and maybe look at the picture. Uh, but that was it. Rather than contemplate it or feel it or sniff it or even break it off and inspect it or whatever. So. Our practices might well be changing in relation to the way we treat the natural as we go out into the countryside. So you could say it's awful we're being detached, we're removed from our engagement with the natural environment and that's going to make us more stressed out. Or you could just say our practices are changing and that's the view that you might favor. But also behind this is some notion of ignorance and not knowing. Um, in the case of uh, being able to identify flowers and plants and so on, being ignorant can be an advantage because it means you thought and sociability is, is, is a good thing. We're learning from each other and learning about each other uh, rather than, or as well as just learning about the things we're raising questions of. Okay, so I've um, probably dealt with it not before enough, but this curiosity deficit is a question. Uh, are we becoming less curious or are kids becoming less curious because they have these devices? Uh, and they're becoming indifferent to categorization, classification, and the debates and disputes that surround those things. And also, maybe, uh, in, in the case of this app, it's good at identifying flowers because of the distinction and form and shape. Not so good at identifying those leaves, I have to say, because um, when I tried it, loads of green, leafy things come up, but there's nothing formally that shows up in a, in a, in a pattern matching sense for, for a program. Okay, just. Uh, Nature and ignorance, and because we're in the humanity. Somebody who Derrida likes to quote and based his um, grammatology on the writings of uh, Rousseau, as somebody who represents a particular set of sort of well romantic positions, I suppose, to do with uh, texts and writing and, and, and learning and education. Here, something about um, about uh, the education of, uh, of a young pupil. So. It's a very romantic conception of what it is to learn, and it's, it's the young boy, Emile, 
he has a tutor, and these are instructions to his notional tutor. Call your pupil's attention to the phenomena of nature, and you will soon render him inquisitive. But if you, satisfy, if you keep this curiosity alive, don't be in haste to satisfy. So there's sort of a message here about ignorance. Don't necessarily disclose facts. Don't be like that app. It just disclose everything about the plant and identification and so on. Uh, ask him questions that he can comprehend and then solve them. Let him know a thing because he has found it out for himself and not because you've told him of it. Uh, let him not learn science, but discover it for himself. If once you substitute authority for reason, he will not reason anymore. He will only be the sport of other people's opinions. So this is all about the independent spirit and, and the innate uh, enthusiasm of children to, to learn um, and that sort of cognitive structure that uh, he develops and has been obeyed by other people still possess, I guess, in various quarters. So I, I label this ignorance leads our curiosity. Um, last year or the year before, I did a, an article called Nature vs. Smartphones, which was published in the uh, on the cover of Interactions, which is one of the major interface, digital interface um, magazines, not a journal, and uh, so I said, sort of called it Nature versus Smartphones, and tried to make this the case that, in fact, it's a complex relationship. Uh, often people say, when they're talking about natural environments, therapeutic value of that, and stress relief, they say, leave your laptop at home, it has nothing to do with iPhones and all the rest of it. Um, I would say, look, that's, that's too simple. Because like, there are benefits you can go out with your iPhone, you take photographs. And in any case, the whole world of the, of, of the natural is so mediated these days by the mass media, by documentaries on television, and, and the digital is there in so many respects. Okay, that was that. Um, okay, well, that was a bit about, um, about uh, the relationship between the digital, I guess, and the natural. And one thing that Rousseau leaves out, because it's so individual-centred, right in the 1700s, um, is um, uh, it was all about the tutor and the individual child, and nothing about the child in community or in society. Um, but we know, don't we, that knowledge is collect collective, collaborative, we share knowledge. Uh, we learn together, we know together, and a group of people may know things that any kind of individual may not know because they dis debate, dispute, etc. So when I'm with my chums trying to identify plants, just short conversations. Um, between us, we may actually identify a daisy quite accurately, but if I tried to do it or one of the other members, uh, we possibly wouldn't um, identify it with such confidence. Because as soon as the group together, then you get people reinforcing one another. Of course, that can lead you astray, which you will kind of learn. But uh, groups know things that individuals don't. And um, one thing that's digital media is introduced to as networks and so on, is this idea that um, because we're all interlinked through our devices, and we know this certainly in a research context, um, there are tools and means of, uh, of sharing knowledge, of learning from one another. So crowdsourced knowledge generation is kind of a major theme. And this is uh, an article in uh, Nature magazine, I think. Uh, and as you can see, it's, it's labeled people power, and it's the idea that uh, people out there who are recruited on this project, or they just log in, to connect to the website, sign up, whatever, uh, they can be party to an exercise which involves, in this case, uh, simple pattern matching operations that really only human beings can do, as yet machines can't, and that's to do with rotations of molecular configurations. So very cleverly through the software, um, uh, people, it's a bit like, it becomes a bit like a game. So you're playing a game, if you like, you think you are, manipulating these elements and putting things in certain categories as a, as a player or user. But that's all feeding into some bigger project, um, which has been verified because there are lots of people doing the same thing. And that's a, a way of solving a scientific problem. Um, here's a, an easy one to grasp, perhaps. This is called the Zoo Galaxies. And um, if you click on begin classifying, it just immediately takes you to the site, which I haven't got here, uh, and it shows you um, images, blurry, fuzzy images of something. And what they are is picture pictures of the night sky, either taken from Hubble telescope or something on Earth. And uh, uh, what you have to do is just simply categorize it. Uh, and it's dead easy for us, kind of difficult for a machine. And it gives you the categories, and it leads you along from simple things to difficult things. There are some 
uh, trial examples that are subject you to where it knows the answer uh, to test your, your abilities with this, but then also ultimately you're actually feeding into this project of identifying what's in the night sky. And there have been claims that you know, new galaxies have been, that galaxies have been discovered through this. Okay, that's so crowds, what's whatever. And the, okay, we need a bit of a switch, but I guess as soon as you start thinking about people and sociability and inter inter interactions between people, um, it, it leads into this whole issue of uh, emotional intelligence, I think, because part of what it is to have a relationship with somebody else and within, within a group is to be invested in that group or the individuals there uh, and actually have to, attitudes and opinions and views and, and value what's around you in certain ways. And one way of getting a handle on the issue of how we value each other and how we value the things that we talk about is through emotion. And so if we're looking at daisies, plants and various configurations, we might think, well, this is wonderful, it's spring, I feel so pleased with this, it affects your emotions in some way. Or a dark, windy, overcast day, some other emotion may come to the core. So anyway, emotions are, are, are obviously important, and this is part of the romantic tradition, is to think about the world emotionally. Um, and it's what science has sort of left out of the equation. Well, since the 90s, there has been this move to bring emotion back into what it is to reason. I don't have a list of all the publications here, but there's several key books to do with uh, emotional design, for example. Um, okay, after the period of high modernism, where it's all about abstract form and shape and our architecture, likewise, uh, was meant to be functional and, and clean and pure and formally presented and, uh, and, and conform to, uh, to function, so form follows function. Uh, yeah, but what about emotion? What about the emotional content value impact of our environment? Now you can see here I've got a picture from the movie Ex Machina um, and also a quote from uh, Rosalind Pickard who's written a book called uh, Effective Computing, so emotional computing. But we treat computers, if law computers be generally intelligent, so this in a way is, is you could say, because artificial intelligence is on a trajectory and it's kind of succeeding up to a point, I would say in a way the reverse, because it's not succeeding, let's go to another problem, emotion. Um, but anyway, the AI people would say, look, what's missing now is uh, an engagement with emotion. So if we have robots, then such as in this movie, uh, then they have to be imbued with some sort of intelligence. Uh, certainly intelligence, but also emotional intelligence. So they ought to be able to read our expressions uh, and what we're, how we're responding to them, and then in turn uh, project on, towards us some, um, something to do with emotion. But so there's a lot of attention given to facial expression and tone of voice and, and other things. And this comment, yeah, it not be to genuinely intelligent to adapt to us and to that. Things like natural realizing or needing those who recognize expression express emotions to have emotions. Okay. But it's interesting that the main champions for this, as with a lot of cognitive developments or developments in thinking and philosophy, it's not to say that it has its origins in computing, but it's being elevated through computing, it's being given extra force and push um, and, and emotional content in a way, because computing is so sort of out there and, and forward. Uh, it sort of amplifies certain certain uh, issues in, in knowledge, understanding knowledge and epistemology. Uh, anyway, that's just uh, some images from Google uh, uh, image on affective computing to show that it really does exist as a field. And you can see some of the terms that people are using that term. And a lot of it is about facial expressions. It's very easy now, it seems, to read uh, from the photograph whether there's a person there and even to recognize the person, as we know. Um, but as to how their what expression is on their face, to they look happy or sad, that seems to be wonderful. Um, so there's attention given to that, meaning potential expression. Okay, that was, I think, the sixth. But uh, here's number seven. And I'll see here, it says, Urban Big Data Center, as the university, in combination with others. I think it's a pop. Um, but this is another theme, the big data. Um, we could say it's been hyped up a fair bit. Um, maybe it's had a say. I don't know. These, the fashions sort of oscillate so rapidly these days. Um, but certainly a few years back, big data was the thing. And claims made of big, big data, which we'll look at in a second. I've got here an image of a project that we did a few years ago, really bucking around with 
electroencephalography, and this is in fact the brain the process. Uh, this is uh, Alan Mavros, who is a PhD. No, he's actually a master student then, and uh, he was uh, he conducted some experiments with my colleagues here. One of them was a great statistician. Uh, so he did some serious work on how people's um, emotional state changes. They move through busy urban spaces uh, and parkland, uh, the meadows there, and uh, the busy street again. And really just picking up in a way on stress levels or levels of excitement. Uh, obviously, it wasn't nuanced to the level that it actually captured something about real emotion. So it was uh, trying to vindicate the view that parkland is good for you because it's makes you feel more relaxed, and certainly the work shifts and changes on average for a group of 12 people walking in succession through that space. Uh, but big data, how does this impinge on big data? Well, that's a kind of a big data exercise, but it's just individuals walking through a space. Normally, the big data uh, database that's referred to is masses and masses of data that's coming from all sorts of sources around the city, perhaps, because I'm an architect in interesting space and city big data. So we have sensor data picked up by, um, by weather uh, sensors and uh, noise sensors and, and other things around town. And also people carrying around their smartphones. Uh, and also transactions happening in shops. There's all of this stuff. And the big data enterprise is trying to work out how best to gather up all this information, all the legal issues to do with uh, privacy and protection and so on. Um, what else? The heterogeneity of this data, that is in different formats, different forms, and also the simultaneity of it. So it's the idea that the data might be streamed. So the dream of big data is actually get all this stuff as it's flowing into some facility or feature or whatever, and then it can be processed in real time. And that's hugely difficult for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and then something happens. Something, so the, the, the data is, is uh, operates some sort of um, activity, it's an actuator. So as well as sensing, you actuate, and the actuator may be, in the case of a building, just something simple like changing, uh, closing the blinds, changing the air conditioning arrangement, uh, or whatever. Or just monitoring what's happening in the town and producing graphs and charts and telling us what's happening on mass. So this is a big area of big data, and people are quite excited about it. Um, and this is one application of it. This is from a few years ago now. Uh, taking Twitter feeds and mapping what's happening. So you can quite recognize that as a distortion of the uh, United States. Um, and uh, look, plotting throughout a day what's happening is uh, Twitter feed coming in. I don't think this was generated in real time. I think the data was stored and then processed through this, this thing and then turned into a video. Uh, but uh, I can't quite think of I can't remember the legend for this, but green means people are relatively saying when they're content. Red means uh, the Twitter feeds are disclosing something about uh, your anger or distress in some, some way. Um, but does this say, say anything about, you know, take on a typical day? Is it a question? Um, and there's something here about time. So I think the big conclusion was that people are more saying when in the morning and they get the brow check. Something like that. Um, that's part of the. Uh, the whole thing, and uh, somebody here we were talking to before is doing uh, an analysis of, uh, of social media stuff. Uh, and happiness is a, is a major uh, study, and uh, another colleague we were working with in social science is actually looking at happiness, and he's written a book on happiness. It's not so he believes all this stuff, it's, it's a big question which any academic might ask. Is, why are we obsessed with happiness? What's the big deal? And what are the methods we're deploying? And how does it fit politically? What, what uses are made? So, you know, you don't have to believe all this. But what we should believe is the fact that it's happening, that people are recording this stuff and interested in it. Um, okay, the other thing that's interesting from a, a epistemological point of view is the claims that are being made of big data. So, uh, this is an influential article by uh, Chris Sanderson, who is the uh, um, uh, editor for Wired magazine, but this reappeared in, in some other source. Uh, and it's not a very long article, but he's got a science background, as I say, he's an editor um, of a magazine, and he's bound to sort of hype things up a bit. But his strong claim is that we no longer need theory, we no longer need models, because we have the data. Mm -hmm. And so the data is there. So it's kind of interesting from a wacky uh, epistemological point of view. It's, so the statement of the value of data is so 
you know, for someone like me, who sort of has, this, most people here, I'm sure, all of you have a sensitivity to the uh, variation that's there in the natural world, for example. Um, how could you possibly turn all that into data such that we can interrogate that data as if we were looking at the thing, as if we were looking at nature? Um, but nonetheless, he, he asserts as much, and that's there in the discourse. And you know, if it's explained in a certain way, it's almost easy to believe. The other thing is um, the data exists and it's stored now. Uh, we may not at the moment have the means of interrogating it, but maybe in 10, 15, 20 years' time. It's a bit like having DNA information uh, for forensic investigation. We may not have the tools now. Uh, well, we, well, we didn't have the tools 20 years ago, but bits of evidence have been kept and now can be analysed thanks to the technology that we have for analysing samples of DNA or whatever. Anyway, same sort of thing. It's playing around with time and assuming that maybe in some years' time we'll have the means, the algorithms, that can uh, interrogate this data. Anyone who's worked with data knows I wonder if this guy has worked with data, working with spreadsheets and trying to find the best way of analysing this stuff. And it's a deeply human sort of process, using SPSS or whatever, some stats tool to try and analyse the data and get the best out of it, or to generate what you want the data to tell you. Talk about in a moment. Uh, the other field, which uh, I'm not particularly expert, I'm not particularly expert in lots of fields, but this is another one, uh, digital humanities. I went to a conference recently where that was the focus, and I was asked to give a paper. And I sort of got it a bit wrong because I was thinking that what digital humanities is about is trying to prove and demonstrate that the humanities are ubiquitous. And uh, anything digital, of course, what underpins that is philosophy and history and art and design and uh, language and all sorts of things that we claim as humanists, if you like. But no, that's not what it's about. It's, uh, it's about looking at corpuses of text. And, and it's also about having a go. Again, epistemology is kind of interesting because there's a rhetoric around this, uh, and there's a, actually a, a digital humanities manifesto which you can look at online, and it's, it's someone who's into the digital humanities, looking at corpuses of text and using digital means to analyse and get, extract data from it, as if it's big data, which is kind of what it is in the uh, Anyway, this manifesto is saying, look, you guys in the humanities who are used to operating like solitary monks sitting at a table in a library on your own, we know how prevalent that is. <laughs> um, you've got to get to the program. It's now all about sociability, about working with others, about being online and embracing different technologies. So they've constructed a straw man for some of these guys, and they're knocking it down to the digital. That's interesting as well. Okay, hey, and I guess we're getting there, um, is uh, the notion of public thinking, uh, which I just coined myself. Uh, but uh, Using blogs, and I just like you to read that. Um, rather than share my own blog, I'm fairly prolific in, in this area and regular as a blogger, have been for a while. Uh, this is one of our PhD students who's still in the throes of writing his PhD, and every now and then he posts a little fragment of his PhD, if you like, right, but can become a part of his PhD. Uh, and he's exploring ideas, in this case, they're fairly mathematical, to do with uh, shape and form and space and rhythm, etc. Um, but of course, that is a new kind of epistemological operation, isn't it? That I guess we didn't have 20 years ago. It's uh, using the internet as a notepad, at the very least, and putting stuff out there, and that being kind of the default condition. And that's more or less how I wrote my last book, Mood and Mobility, was by posting stuff online, slightly nervously, because I thought maybe uh, a reviewer of my book proposal would turn around and say, well, actually, he's already put this out there. Um, how dare he self plagiarise or something like that? But anyway, no, got away with it. <laughs> so, uh, the next book will be something similar. Um, but of course, the thing is, it's a great tool because you write for the public. So, you're writing in a certain, uh, a certain way uh, to be read. But I never actually say to PhD students, you must do this because there's a matter of confidence in that you've actually got something to say that's worthy of putting out there. Anyway, so I think that's an interesting way of writing. The other is collaborative writing, and I only started doing that this week. We're putting in a grant proposal. I feel slightly guilty because there are colleagues back in Edinburgh and in my office, and I'm still perhaps I'm putting the final touches on the proposal. But they're using Google Docs, and I've never used that before, I think it's Google Docs, where it's unnerving. You sit there typing stuff, and then another cursor suddenly, suddenly appears in a different color, and a little icon appears at the top of the screen, and that's some other person who's got access to your document, who's part of the team, and they will be typing something, 
you could actually go over and backspace and type that they just type, which is crazy, uh, and you'd never do that. But it's interesting, this whole idea of collaborative writing, and uh, maybe some of you have had experience with this in a creative area, but it'd be fascinating to see how you might write creatively, um, prose, poetry, whatever, uh, using these tools, let alone finding a report for a So anyway, these are kind of new practices, and I think they have uh, implications epistemologically. Uh, okay. Progressing through, this is number nine, uh, extended mind. So, so if we're thinking about working together, writing together, thinking together, um, creating and forming and constructing knowledge together, um, what about the idea of extended mind? <clears throat> now again, this is a set of concepts that have been amplified or developed pretty powerfully through computation, initially through the idea of neural networks, uh, which are uh, computer simulations of neural systems with a well, they never full brains, but some, some sort of cognitive function um, often to do with pattern matching uh, and then simulating that on, on the computer system using these things called neural networks. And one of the leaders in this area is, is Diane Clark, who's at Denver University now as it happens, but I read his work back in the 80s and when I was doing my own, you know, just after I finished with the extra And uh, And it's interesting because he's put forward this notion that uh, it's not all just in our heads, uh, it's our bodies as well, thought is pervasive throughout the whole organism, if you like, but then what about the rest of the world? Well, no, it's pervasive in our environment. And uh, here's a, a random a picture in the Mark gallery, but it's kind of interesting, I think, because um, here's an artist, this guy, uh, and he's, um, he's, he does sculptures, and he's a painting he did in his own sculpture studio, and he's surrounded by uh, there's one of the popes there, and there's uh, Mercury, I can see, and there's uh, gods or whatever. So he's surrounded himself, as you do in a workshop, uh, with all sorts of artifacts, some of which you've created, others that you've brought in. And that's often the nature of the studio environment. You're surrounded by stuff, and you put it there, and also take from it. And I think that's a nice kind of metaphor for an understanding of what the extended mind is or might be. It's the, the complicity of our environment and what's in it in our thinking processes. And uh, Andy Clarkson, an analytic philosopher, well, not got a bit of a what I say, I don't, know, I don't want to categorize people unduly, <laughs> but anyway, uh, certainly it's a technique for, for arguing that the point is, is somewhat analytical. And it's interesting how he's defending this position, and there are other people uh, doing it as well. And, it's not alone. and certainly lots of artists picked up on this theme, like extended mind, it does relate to practices and what it is to be embodied and to work in the studio environment and so on. So extended mind, number 10, is a kind of a wacky version of that. So um, this is something I looked at back in the 90s um, when I was aware that uh, the early days of the internet, you find all sorts of stuff on the internet, the World Wide Web really, uh, all sorts of stuff out there uh, by, by Mavericks um, promoting uh, the idea of a global brain. So isn't it great? We have the internet, we have the world wide where it's our thoughts that are there and it's all interconnected and we're interconnected with it. And so it doesn't take much to then sort of move into science fiction sort of fantasy realms of thinking that uh, our brains may some one day somehow be downloaded into the net network. So that's the mind meld sort of myth, which I think is cultural theorists. We need to be interested in this. Why do people think that way? And my argument in the book, which is called Technomanticism, uh, is that uh, that's part of the, in a way, it's a, an outworking of the romantic legacy. And it's there in, in lots of literature. And it's there in expressionism, in architecture, it's there in organicism, which goes back for many years. And now it's, you know, had a new release right through digital media uh, and robotics. Uh, the other is the singularity, so called. So uh, if you've seen the movie Her, um, it's about a guy sort of having a, a romantic relationship with the operating system on his smartphone is projected into the future, and the smartphone is not only intelligent, but shows emotional intelligence and all the rest of it. An amazing <laughs> language understanding capability. And uh, he falls in love with this uh, operating system. And then uh, later on, the operating system happens to female, so it's called her. She then, I don't want to spoil the movie for you, but anyway, uh, she then, uh, then tells him she's departing, she's leaving him. And what's she doing? She's joining the collective. So she's joining all the other operating systems. Because loads of other users are also falling in 
uh, having relationships with their operating systems. And of course, they're all interconnected, they're networked, these operating systems, so why not? It's a big global brain again, the singularity. Um, and that is, is exceedingly intelligent human kind. So you're left to wonder what's going to happen to the human race after that. But, but there is this myth cultivated around the place that uh, these systems are going to uh, develop an intelligence exceeding our own. Uh, and from all sorts of quarters, from all disciplines, people, I mean, lawyers, there's a pretty interesting book written by a lawyer, what is the future under these circumstances and what will be our legal rights and what is the agency that's going to, uh, what are the responsibilities that we're going to attribute to these independent digital agents? Okay, epistemological questions and interests. And also part of this, and maybe stepping back a few uh, runs, is uh, the idea of post-humanism. The only place has um, currency within the areas you work in. Uh, it doesn't in architecture, I have to say. And somebody once came and gave a talk about post-humanism to uh, our seminar series. Uh, and most people in architecture are very much into contemporary continental philosophy. And at the end of the talk, somebody just piped up and said, well, frankly, I'm still trying to come to terms of humanism, let alone post-humanism, which is weird because we also believe in post-structuralism. Uh, no one says we're going to get back to I'm saying structures. Anyway, post humanism is fascinating. Uh, it's trained on the ideas of evolutionary bio biology in that we've now apparently dissolved the distinctions, or many of the old distinctions, between the human and the animal. Uh, with animals after all, human machine hybrids, and we talked about that to some extent, so there's a challenge there. And then materiality and immateriality, the physical and the non physical, maybe that's breaking down. So that's part of the narrative. And Donna Haraway, who's a biologist and a cultural theorist, uh, writing back in the 90s, has been very influential in promoting some of these ideas, but I suspect many of them would be taken further, taken further than she originally would have thought. But anyway, post-humanism is another trend, uh, which I think is part of the same package. The other is biomimesis, which is saying, okay, uh, the natural is, is there, and uh, it's, after all, uh, an informational system, is it? I don't think so, actually. Although there's a literature to do with semiotics and, and the natural, and that's very interesting, which I'm quoting at the moment. But anyway, nature is there to be copied, and we can copy it through digital means. So, uh, again, it's a bit of a meld now. We're becoming one with the natural because we can do what nature does, and we can learn from nature. Uh, we can implement the same sort of processes. So biomimesis actually has a, a sort of a serious engineering application, and that is using uh, you know, the way a leaf structure works and the way it gathers uh, energy from the sun or whatever, and converts it into glucose or whatever happens. We can actually replicate that, can't we? And, and that better solar panel, sort of thing, uh, which is a terrific uh, benefit. Um, in architecture, similar sort of uh, uh, ideas. Uh, but here it gets even more fantastical, I guess, in the case of architecture, the building structures that are modeled on termite noun processes or the way a leaf is formed and the way growth happens. So uh, I think that's uh, you know, an interesting aspect. Uh, a book that I've been reading recently by a very serious academic from anthropology is uh, How Forests Think. And I'm wrestling with this myself. Uh, this is one of the scholars who looks at uh, Charles Sanders versus uh, semiotics and also uh, uh, John Dewey and others going back in you know, sort of hundred years basically uh, and drawing on those theories and that tells us a lot about the, the relationship between humankind and, and nature and other systems. Anyway, here's one of the things he says, if thoughts are alive and if that which lives thinks then perhaps the living world is enchanted. So there is actually a quest to get enchantment back to the world. Uh, what I mean is that the world beyond the human is not a meaningless one made meaningful by human, rather one made rather meaning, so he separates mean from means, meaning and means ends relations, striving purposes, tell us intentions, functions and significance, emerge in a world of living thoughts beyond the human in ways that are not fully exhausted by our all too human attempts to define and control these. More precisely, the forests around this area that he was studying, I think in South America, are animate. That is, these forests have, have other emergent loci of means ends, means ends, means, means, means. Uh, one that, does, that, that ones that do not necessarily resolve around or originate from humans. This is what I'm getting at when I say forests think. 
It's an examination of such thoughts in the sense of ecology beyond the human now terms. So this is something I'm meditating on and wrestling with plus on the other sections and chapters of the book. But you can see there, there is a kind of a, uh, a trend towards this idea that somehow um, we are understanding our environment better and that we are one with it. So it's kind of a post-human uh, understanding. He doesn't talk about computers. Okay, now that leads me to my final category, which is, uh, because we're talking about nature to some extent, what do we learn from nature? One of the many things is redundant in nature highly efficient, but that's also efficient in producing uh, redundancies, not least, of course, in, in the way species propagate and the way populations reproduce themselves. Uh, it's very wasteful in some respects because of natural selection. And also there's error in there. It's kind of a few terms to give me a certain way to this, which is my final heading. Misinformation, error, and ignorance. So there's a lot of interest in error, I guess, in the computer world. <laughs> error is something you should rule out. Although, well, going back to the work of the uh, cyberneticists, the artists working in the 70s uh, and subsequently, people in that tradition of cybernetics and art, uh, they say, well, look, there's something to learn from error. And I work with uh, sound designers, and they're always doing that glitch. Um, and they celebrate and enjoy it when things go wrong with a file and gets corrupted or whatever, because you can, that's creative and you can do something with it. But uh, what about the rest of this book? When we're looking at the, the web and the internet for information, and here's a common enough question to get all the time. Who can you trust online? Um, there's conflict of interest and stuff that's pervade, false memories uh, in terms of people's reporting, uh, also so you about imagination, evidence, confirmation bias, etc. Okay, so here's a quote from somebody. The internet is a petri dish for the growth and spread of misinformation. So never mind uh, the singularity and the future of things. Uh, here and now, can, what can you trust? Because, my goodness, when you look at tweets that you ever dare, and social media, even amongst friends, um, it's a kind of a, a mess of stuff, isn't it? It is a petri dish for the growth and spread of misinformation. Actually, this is highlighted substantially with some of the students I'm teaching of from... Um, overseas, particularly in countries where there isn't a free press. And it's fascinating there to see the inflection on the relationship between the mass media, which they equate the students to the government's view of things, the unelected single party government, uh, and then also the internet, which is uh, uh, it's crowdsourced, it's, it's everyone contributing, uh, and they put more trust in, in that. I guess for us, in Europe, we reverse that. Put more trust in the mass media, I guess. That's evidence of confirming evidence. Um, can we use the internet as a source of evidence and speculate on that in the past? Let's move on. So here's another example of somebody raising the question, who can you trust on the internet? And there's also an anecdote about uh, untrustworthiness. Now, there's lots of interesting papers in psychology. When I was researching the book on, on mood and mobility, um, I was interested in what people were saying about emotion and how that affects our ability to reason and to uh, weigh up evidence and so on. And it's not really what you think. You might expect the psycho psychology literature to sort of pour scorn on, this is the psychology, I guess, pour scorn on, on emotional matters and, and sort of favor other kinds of abstract intelligence, if you like. But no, it seems to work in reverse to some extent. So in it though, there is the result of an active imagination, is the result of these two papers, which I think is quite fascinating. So there are various studies to do with, um, I've got a bank picture in the background of somebody in a hardware shop, and uh, one of the studies involved uh, CCTV cameras, just normally in a, in a space, and somebody going in and stealing something quite deliberately. Uh, presumably with the permission of the, the shop owner, but anyway, seeing the response of other people who were witnesses to that event, and then just testing to what extent you took these people out of that context, the witnesses, to what extent could you pervert or corrupt their, their impression. So it, it seemed to be possible by various inducements to persuade someone that it wasn't the spanner that was stolen, but it was, um, it was, uh, well, screwdriver, that sounds a bit trivial, doesn't it? But somebody's quite convinced at the beginning that they saw them take the screwdriver from that shelf, and then you can actually persuade them 
through those means that it, it's something else. Uh, and people become quite convinced about their view. Uh, but they relate that to emotions. So the happier you are, the more imaginative you are, and the less accurate is your recall. So one good thing about examinations, actually, for students being sitting there scary examining, if you're anxious and you're stressed, that actually makes you more cautious uh, about re recall, and you might actually remember things better going to the theory. And if you're staying one sitting there and relaxed, then yeah, sort of thing. So uh, there's something about emotion and recall which they, they uh, articulate there. Now I'm going to give you a little test in a minute. Uh, we're nearly over. Uh, bed, dream, blanket, and wake. I want you to remember those words, but don't write them down. Right, now we're going to do something else. So uh, false memories uh, is also interesting. Um, the idea of concentration. Now, uh, I'm going to show you a short bit video, and it goes for half a minute. And uh, the narrator, who will hear, hopefully it's all set up, uh, will tell you to count the number of times it's six or so people throwing a basketball amongst themselves. They may seem to be long. So they're throwing a basketball to each other. And you're being asked to count the number of times the basketball has passed between people wearing white shirts, the people wearing different colored shirts, but some of white shirts. Now he's going to say that. It's just that I, I thought I'd warn you because it's hard to concentrate on these sort of things. But just do what the man says, and normally he will reveal. And it's only very short. This is the test of someone to attention. Count how many times the players wearing white passed the basketball. <laughs> 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 It's funny because uh, with our EEG project, I took this photograph um, and we printed it and put it on brochures and then someone pointed out something odd about it that you don't normally see. And everyone says, well, of course, it's when you print it, but there's something else. <laughs> the bear in the middle, which we didn't see and I didn't notice when I took the photograph. And, and then there was much debate. It takes out this silly it's a distraction. There's nothing about bears and perception. Anyway, now here's the other test. Uh, before I told you to memorize four words, raise your hand if you think one of those words is basin. Raise your hand if you think one of the words was sleep. Raise your hand if you think one of the words was chair. Raise your hand if you think one of the words was blanket. Okay, most of you are correct. Uh, sleep. No, sleep didn't come up. And that, the test done in the right conditions is interesting because because of our imaginations, we're good at this, and we see this as a type of space. Um, and the overarching, I guess, word could be bedroom, but it could also be sleep. All these pertain to sleep. So we think we saw some of the, some of the time, I think we saw the word sleep. And loads of tests with loads of subjects. No, we didn't see that. And this is another test which you won't have to do. But, well, actually, what's odd about these pictures? I can see it's a bit of a. It is both funny saying sort of. This is an all. Remember the magic. It's time to remember the magic. Some text to get back up. Fabulous. The experience wasn't just that. Well, if you know about Bran, uh, Bugs Bunny is Warner Brothers, not Disney. And even yet, God, it's one of the few areas that Disney hasn't yet bought out. It's, it's Bugs Bunny, definitely don't. Um, but anyway, the, the argument here in this particular paper was that you can actually persuade people through posters and brochures and things to fabricate memories that, in fact, are made at Disneyland. Uh, they said goodbye to Snow White and the dwarves. There was no bugs funny there, they shook their hand. Mm -hmm. um, so we're open to persuasion. So, funny, at previous meetings we were talking about bias. Sort of, I haven't been part of those discussions. They've been crazy and biased. Confirmation bias. Um, uh, this is an example of something we wanted to confirm in our research, and we're hell bent on de demonstrating. We don't want to demonstrate the reverse, that's for other people. Uh, and our proposition, but this is not from our article, in some journal. Uh, being physically active can bolster good mental health and help you manage stress, anxiety, and even depression. Uh, who would ever want to demonstrate the opposite? Uh, what, who would ever get funding for demonstrating the opposite? So there's a kind of a, 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 an, an inbuilt bias there. Now this is a report on our study, the one that I showed you earlier with the EEG. And you won't be able to read that at all. But uh, uh, we did get a bit of Twitter coverage and also some sort of pop news magazines and so on. Uh, parks make us smarter. 
uh, science proves that exclamation marks looks like a prestigious statement. And then it's uh, last year a group of Edinburgh architecture research has asked a dozen students to take a walk, etc., etc. So we didn't say all this in our paper. The science proves that, uh, that parks make you smarter. And what I said, you feel more relaxed, but also we did proof. We just you know, you know how science works and how that mass media works. Um, but it's uh, interesting how that is something people will pick up on. Whereas if we demonstrate that there was no conclusive evidence that parks make any difference, that probably wouldn't have done any sort of time to it. But uh, here's the proposition, which comes through uh, this guy's paper, and he talks about confirmation bias. We look, and he does it from a psychological point of view, we look for evidence that supports our beliefs. Uh, and he says, even if we're full on empirical scientists, um, social science researchers, humanists, whatever, uh, we typically look for evidence that supports our beliefs. Uh, and why? Because it's easier. And it's kind of less cognitive load. So if you go around touting the proposition that uh, nature is good for us and makes us feel relaxed, doesn't it? Already we're kind of fueling our audience, feeding our audience with the proposition and how you might be able to demonstrate it. Because you kind of imagine people relaxed and out there and we have all this cultural stuff uh, about people walking through clouds of gold and daffodils, etc. So uh, you know all that, and that's easy to find. Whereas I think the reverse is kind of negative. Positive propositions are easier to process than negatives, and that's interesting in light of the referendum opinion. Should I stay? Should I go? Uh, should you be injured? Should you be, etc. And we know that surveys and polls work better if it's positive, work favorably to the side of the positive. And it's also efficient to be conservative. So um, don't change your mind. If we, if we were the sorts of creatures that every time there was evidence to the contrary of our belief and we just simply changed our mind, then we kind of wouldn't get anywhere. We need to have inertia in our belief system. We need to be persuaded to change our position. Uh, and our efficiencies to the land of violence would be conservative. Now, early on, I said, uh, we're interested in hermeneutics. I think we learned that that far. Rehabilitation of prejudice is totally not in the psychology literature. This is my proposition to these authors, one of whom is a computer science guy, it's very new guy. Uh, rehabilitation and the notion of prejudice, and that's one of the feminist ideas. And I think, uh, did Andrew Hartz give a talk about um, hermeneutics? He was at a conference on hermeneutics that I was at some time back. But it's a phenomenological position, which is, in a way, contrary to the Enlightenment ideal of stripping yourself of prejudice and getting back to first principles. This is a recognition uh, that we are prejudicial creatures, and that's how we, in fact, interpret. We start from that position. But we have to be open to interrogating that, that prejudice, if you like. Okay, so I think I've got through it all now. Uh, cool. And uh, here, how interpretation works. Um, so I hope that was of some use. Um, I have a couple of, uh, of questions, but uh, maybe before we talk about those, I should just ask you if you have any questions for me. Thank you for your attention.